Uh, I'm excited to be sharing with you this morning, and I need to give you a little update as we uh, are working through the sermon series of uh, getting rid of the negative. Enough with the negative is what Barry's entitled it. And I'm going to be sharing with you about gratefulness and being gra- grateful. And I was just like, hey, you know what? I also need to update. I need to update Living Hope on what's going on in mine and my wife's life. We call it the Benziger household. So I thought I'd give us a funny way to do it. Uh, I wanted to do it David Letterman style with the top 10 things that the Benziger household is grateful for during a pandemic. I know it's a mouthful. But a uh, couple of things. These are all borderline silly. Some of them are true. Uh, number 10, I just, I'm just so grateful for haircuts. I don't know about you. Like, just so grateful that like, there's places to get our hair done. I know my wife was like super excited. Uh, that's a great thing. Uh, number, nine, not, number 9 is completely lighthearted. Uh, there's this website called Babylon Bee. If you're ever on the internet, known as Facebook or Instagram, and you see all these funny satire posts, uh, you should know that Babylon Bee is the thing that keeps me laughing. I don't know what it is. It's Christians making fun of Christians, essentially, so I don't feel bad about it. It's Christian satire. If you're ever like, hey, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want a good laugh instead of annoying Facebook feed of depressing, arguing, this and that, check out Babylon Bee. Number, number eight is go-to menus. Uh, restaurants, man, they have figured out how to make sure they stay afloat, and they've given us go-to menus. Uh, number seven was early on during the pandemic. I thought, you know what? This is time. We're not doing anything. I'm going to learn something new. I thought I'd try juggling. I'm still terrible at juggling. Uh, Number six, this is one for you guys. I really, 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 really am grateful for the fact that we get to do corporate worship, even during a weird pandemic. Uh, That's just a blessing to me to see you guys. The last time I spoke, it was me and Barry and Colleen. And so, uh, yeah, this is way better seeing faces. I really, really enjoy that. Uh, Number five is more family time. I mean, just truthfully and honestly, I'm grateful for that. And you're like, why is that number five and not number one? Because I'm trying to be silly. Uh, Number four is remodel projects. Raise your hand if you, during this pandemic since March, have started a remodel project. Yeah, I see hands. Yeah, everyone's kind of working on something. I have a big one. Uh, Number three, along with that remodel projects, I'm so thankful for roofers and my stucco guy. My goodness, we've been working on our house, and I'm so happy I do not have to do the roof or the stucco, because that looks like it's backbreaking work. Uh, Number two, I'm grateful for my 11-month-old's 8 p.m. bedtime. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely grateful for that. And the number one thing I'm most grateful for also has to do with my son is Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Here's the deal. Uh, we are Disney fans, sure. Showed him Mickey Mouse. He lights up. It's crazy. He's just oh, so excited. He sees Mickey come on the screen and he smiles way differently than he even smiles for mom or me or anybody. And then the other thing is it's, he doesn't really watch, watch it. It's not like he sits there for 30 minutes and like watches it. He's watching it. It's in the background, but he hears the songs. And so anytime he's in a fussy mood or frustrated, which is rare because our kid is just an angel, uh, mostly when mom is changing him or after bedtime, he's a little fussy. All we have to do is start singing the theme song. And I'm not going to do that because I'm not the singer of the family. I let Jocelyn do it. But hot dog, hot dog, hot diggity dog. So uh, you start singing it and he just turns the smile. So I am so grateful for all these silly things, yes, to kind of lighten the mood. And there's some serious ones on there. And I want to share with you this morning, share with you this morning, because to get rid of the negative, to get rid of the negative in our lives, we really need to work on how grateful we are. We really need to need to work on how grateful we are. We need to choose gratitude. We need to choose gratitude. And along with that, in order to do that, we need to stop this thing right here, complaining. We need to stop complaining. Man, we complain about everything. We do. It's too hot. It's too cold. You're driving too fast, too slow. There's no food in the house. We sound like what I deal with all the time, 13 to 16-year-olds. I'm bored. Like We just whine about everything. We complain about everything. We can pick apart the whole world and just uh, complain, complain, complain. I'd like to argue that complaining is the real pandemic in our country. I, I really believe that. When things don't go your way, what do you do? You complain about it. Hey, listen, if you look at my top 10 list, you know that some of those things uh, have to do with Facebook and Instagram. And guess what? That's just a place right now that I did not foresee this happening a year ago where people just tend to complain 
and be keyboard warriors and get frustrated. They use it to fight. They use it to bicker. When they should be doing stuff like we're doing with Facebook, sharing messages, sharing worship, sharing awesome, positive things, instead of just complaining about what's going on. Don't get me wrong. Do I wish COVID didn't exist? Sure. Do I wish that there wasn't racism in our country? Sure. Do I wish murder hornets weren't an actual thing? Sure. Do I wish that keyboard warriors would stop picking fights and probing at people on the internet? Sure. What's funny is all those things that I just said are kind of complaints about what we do. I want to tell you a story. It's found in Luke chapter 17. It's a real small chapter, and I, like for whatever reason, even through my Bible college background, there wasn't even like, I didn't have any notes or thoughts on my Bible about Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. And this is Jesus as he's traveling. As he's traveling, here we go. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between some Samaria and Galilee. Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, social distancing, hey, look at that, uh, stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Verse 14. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest, and as they went, they were cleansed. It's very interesting, right? They're like, Hey, the, the, lepers, the lepers are, hey, Jesus, we're over here, we're over here, and, and have pity on us. He's like, hey, just go to show up to the priest, you'll be clean. And why, what's so interesting about that is if you look in the Old Testament, I'm not going to read it because it's a long and lengthy, of how to handle, handle the unclean, it's found in Leviticus chapter 13. And what would happen was is if, for whatever reason, they were healed and they were cured, they'd have to go to the priest to go check them out to make sure that they were unclean. I'm pretty sure me and Barry are pretty happy that that's not the case anymore because we don't want to deal with all you COVID people. So, I, these are jokes. Thank you. I'm glad someone's laughing. So, now, what's interesting is they would do that so that they can become a part of society. The lepers, they would get leprosy and they'd be kicked out. They'd live in their own little leper villages about 10 miles outside of town. They'd have, they barely get any food. They barely get water. From my understanding, it was kind of like a supply drop and good luck. Uh, and these people were unclean, and they must live separate. And what was interesting is they would go to the priest and go, hey, I'm normal. I'm healed. I'm cured. And the priest would ride off on it. And so as we continue on in our story in Luke chapter 17, in verse 15, one of them when he saw was healed, came back praising God. In a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was the Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. It's kind of interesting. After ten men get healed, only one comes back and praises God only one. Listen, I'm not a mathematician, but one out of ten, that's not a good batting average. That's not a good score on a test. Uh, that's 10% for those of you keeping track. That's not good. And what's interesting, what's interesting is this, per, the, this guy decided, I'm going to go give him praise. I'm going to go give him praise in this situation. He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be thanked. And and I find it so interesting. I find it so interesting. I see this kind of in my everyday life. Uh, one of my chores at home is doing the dishes. And one of my favorite things about my wife is no matter how bad of a day it is, no matter uh, we've been out of each other's throats or a good day, it doesn't really matter what the case is. If I do the dishes, I always get a thank you. I always get some gratitude. Thank you for spending time out of your day to do a chore. I do that's my chore. I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do. Like, she doesn't have to do that. And what's really sad is she does the laundry most times, and I forget to say thank you. I forget to say thank you for those situations. And I become like those nine that just kind of forget that something awesome happened. A life-changing experience happened for these ten men. They went from living ostracized in a camp outside of the city to completely healed and now going back to their families. And I guarantee at some point in their life, at some point in their life, 
They went back and they started, yes, it was a good, joyous time. They got to be a part of their family. They got to see their friends. They got to worship, go to church, synagogue, whatever the case may be. And at some point in their life, I'm sure they still complained. They had a life-changing event. And they still figured out a way to complain. Now, I like to play the what-if game with my junior hires and high schoolers. And one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to sit Jesus down and ask my millions of questions of what if. Or can you explain this a little bit more? Or tell me more about this story. Uh, this, this story I'm pretty sure Jesus is going to laugh at. He's going to be like, what? why do you care so much? And I, and I want to know. I want to know what the other nine, you know, what was their quote-unquote excuse for not going back and giving praise to God for something so dramatic and life-changing. I know today on your drive home, you might be sitting there uh, talking to your significant others, your family members, like, oh, Josh, really, his sermon kind of stunk. You might even find yourself wanting to complain a little bit, being hypercritical. And I'd like to challenge you that you're missing so many moments in life that God has given you. Complaining, the real pandemic that won't go away. It just won't go away. However, I'd argue that if we choose gratitude, it will alter our attitude. If we choose gratitude, it will alter our attitude. Choosing gratitude looks something like this in James chapter 1, verse 17. When we are being grateful, keep this in mind. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like sifting shadows. We have a lot to be grateful just in this verse alone. If that was the Bible, and not, it's not, but that was one of the big gigantic promises, and boom, and this was it, and that's all we had to live off of, there's already two things right there that we have to be grateful. That one, good and perfect gifts. Good and perfect gifts. I don't know about you, but I'm not the best gift giver, and I don't, I'm also not the easiest person to shop for, so I don't really complain too much about it, but I will say this, good and perfect gifts. I'm with Colleen on this one because I know Colleen's perfect gift is cash. Uh, I, I, that, that probably is where I fall. And what's so interesting, good and perfect gifts, he's not talking about monetary things. He's talking about things that are even better than that. It's worthy to be praised, worthy to be, be grateful for, these good and perfect gifts. And then the other thing that I see in this verse that is so huge is that God is not wavering. He's not changing. Hebrews 13.8, I don't have this one in there, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He's the same. Something to be grateful for is that he is that rock. It's not shifting like the shadows. So, I'd say this. There are three things that will help us choose gratitude. Number one, every good thing comes from God. Every good and perfect gift is what it just said in James chapter 1. And then the one, uh, number two is my wants will not rob me from what I have. My wants will not rob me from what I have. You have to understand something. In order for us to be grateful, we, we tend to always think about all the stuff. But then we also want more. And I'd have to argue that we have so much already. We have so much already. We live in this country. We have freedom. Last Saturday as I'm driving, driving back down from the church into Oakdale, it looked like Disneyland Oakdale did with all these illegal fireworks. And I just started thinking like, holy cow. Like, was just astonished. Astonished at the fact that we have so much freedom. We have so much to the, to the point where we get to go to church. We get to have our own Bibles. We have a roof over our head, running water. In 2003, my eyes were completely open to this when I decided to go to Haiti for a week. Ten weeks before I graduated high school, I thought the world was just so much fun and so great and God's awesome. And I get to Haiti and I get off the plane and I realize I made a bad decision because my heart was broken and forever changed. They have nothing. The whole country smells like burning trash. Just, just absolute nothing. And as we got to visit and hang out with orphans, we just happened to be there one day where uh, the Christmas shoeboxes that we've done in the past were being delivered. 
And I got to see this little seven, eight-year-old boy. He got his box and he opened it. And I mean, it had maybe, maybe $15, $20 worth of stuff that we have here that you just buy on the grocery store at the end aisle or the end caps as you're walking out. I mean, little to nothing. A pair of socks, toothbrush, and a little toy car. And he's so excited. It was his prized possession. His brother comes over to take a look at it. He slams in and goes, no, this is mine. And I just remember thinking as an 18-year-old going, all right, I have so much. But yet, yet we constantly are wanting more. And yet we constantly, constantly desire the biggest, the baddest, the fastest. And what's so crazy about that is it leads us to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 9. Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Like chasing the wind. I don't know about you, but that, that seems crazy and pointless, chasing the wind. Being grateful turns what we have into enough. Being grateful turns what we have into being enough. Now, you might not have the biggest house or the biggest car or all the money in the world ever. You have to understand that. But don't let it get in your way. Don't let it get in the way of the fact that you need to be grateful for the things you do have. Don't let your wants rob you from what you already have. Now, I listen, to, I listen to a lot of sports, and I make my wife during pandemic, she, very early on, we watched a lot of ESPN, even though they were just talking about when sports coming back, this and that. The one thing that always happens during sports debates and sports talk, if you don't listen, is this argument of who's the greatest ever. They call it the GOAT, greatest of all time. And uh, when it comes to basketball, the argument is down to two people, is what the media will tell you. If you don't believe them, that's fine. Uh, it comes down to Michael Jordan or LeBron James. And what's so interesting is me and my wife can go back and forth and we can argue one point, oh, this and that. She loves sports too. Uh, and out of nowhere, out of nowhere, I've kind of been shifting going, whoa, 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 hang on. How about we just be grateful for the fact, why don't we just be grateful for the fact that I get to watch. I get to watch this young man named LeBron James, I say young because he's three months older than me, play basketball. And I think it's so interesting that we're just so busy about comparing and, and, of course, there's always complaints about different points of view. But along with all of this, along with all of this, is we actually get to enjoy seeing that. That idea, that idea of being content with where you're at and what you have. Being what you have. Now, what's interesting about that argument is a lot of the times... A lot of the times we have to look at the past. When it comes to the sports, they're comparing two different eras. Michael Jordan played when I was a kid, and now LeBron is playing as, as I'm a younger adult. And what's so interesting is that past idea. We, we need to understand and actually take into consideration that our past is part of the things that we need to be grateful for. It's part of the things that we need to be grateful for. Even though, even though your past might be hardships, even though your life might be full of trials and tribulation, we still need to be grateful for the fact that you are here today and that you are breathing. You are here today and that you are breathing. This morning, the third thing that I want to help us choose Gratitude is this, number three, and we're going to practice this, turning every blessing into praise. One of my favorite th things about being on the worship team on Sundays is that we do this quite often because music tends to lend itself to the praise when it comes to church music. Maybe you need some encouragement this morning, so I want you to check out these words found in Philippians. Philippians 4, chap uh, chapter 4, verse 11 says this, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. 
I can do all things. Not little, not small, not just the big things, but all things. A little trivia about me, when I was in high school, I also had a letterman's jacket, and on that jacket, I had that verse as a reminder. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And for those four months that I wore that jacket, because that's how long I had it for, uh, I, I would use that as a gigantic, gigantic reminder gigantic reminder that I can do all things. Very similar, if you're looking for a little bit extra motivation and keep going, I challenge you to go listen to Pastor Barry's Pursue Part 6 message. He gave us two copper coins. If you weren't here, he gave us two pennies. And it was just a reminder that even when you're down on your log, you're down at the bottom of the barrel, you got nothing left, you still have two copper coins. And man, that's been motivation for me in the last couple weeks to just man up, to, to not be so lazy, to not just sit around during this pandemic and, and, and actually get up and do something and not be just what it could be, a lazy, lazy time. Now I say all of this, I say all of this and I challenge you with this to remember that you can do all things and that we're going to turn our, we're going to turn, excuse me, we're going to turn uh, our blessings into praise and I absolutely love that idea. And one of the things that we are grateful for and should be praising is found in Psalms 63, verse 4. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. And as we continue on, we look at Psalms chapter 103. There's a list of a couple of things to be praising him for. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who, reminds your life, uh, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desire with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We need to count our blessings and praise him for the perfect gifts he gives us, for the, for the just abundance, abundance of love that he gives us, the fact that he's even there and walks alongside us each and every day is still astonishment. And so my challenge to you, my challenge to you is to choose gratitude. Choose gratitude. We need to get rid of all the negativity in our lives, including the amount of complaining that we do, and focus on gratitude. We're going to choose gratitude by these three things. Every good thing comes from God. My wants will not rob me from what I have, and we need to turn every blessing into praise. Now this morning, I have a couple of applications, and in a second, the worship band's gonna come up and sing an oldie, but I call it a goodie, of how we're gonna turn it into praise. But, but as they're coming up, I have a, a pretty blatant to the point application points, and is this one right here. Number one, stop complaining. Stop complaining. Whether it's on the internet, to your spouse, to your kids, hopefully you don't do that, but to your kids, whatever the case may be, work on how much you can complain. Number two is this. I challenge you to come up with a list or a journal of gratitude. A list or a journal. I jokingly made a top 10 list. Those are things I'm legitimately grateful for, as silly as they are. And if I had a serious one, It'd be, it'd be a, lot, a lot more intense, of course. But I challenge you, if you're someone who struggles with complaining, to find in the time, write down, write down some things you're grateful for. And you're like, oh, I don't write any, anything down ever, Josh, because I'll lose it, okay? You all have a cell phone, put it in there. Number three, be grateful. We have so much. God has blessed us with so much. And this morning, as we end in a song, and the lyrics of the song are, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I challenge you, Living Hope, this week to work on these things and turn it back to praise. All the blessings he gives us. He's given us so much. Would you pray with me? God, you are so good. You are so worthy to be praised. 
I ask that this congregation would stop complaining, stop whining, stop focusing on the negative things in life because we're done with that. God, help us this week to be grateful and the rest of our lives to remember that you are so amazing, so good, so powerful, and you've given us so much. And as we are challenged by your word and encouraged by it and strengthened by it, it impacts our core. May we do some of these things, like put a gratitude list together, like getting rid of the whininess to us, the complainingness to us. And help us, God, each and every one of us, be more grateful, including turning it back to praise. Count every blessing as a praise, God. We give you all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.